Well, as we come to our time of study in the Word of God, I want to kind of adjust course a bit this morning, as you've noticed in your bulletin, in light of the fact that this is the day that Hallmark, at least, calls Mother's Day. You know me, I'm not much for Hallmark holidays. But this is the day in which Hallmark, at least, tells us that it's Mother's Day. I want to just take a moment this morning and address all of those of us who have influence over others' lives. And that means all of us, not just parents, not just mothers and fathers, but all of us who have influence over others. And so I don't really want to just address a specific group of people. I want to address all of us, as I hope to do in what we're going to talk about this morning. <clears throat> Some time ago, I taught a message here entitled, How to Raise a Fool. How to Raise a Fool. Some of you may remember that. And since then, I've been asked several different times by individuals, and I'm often reminded in my own heart of these principles, and they've asked me from time to time if I could do that again in the future, and I, so I thought this would be the appropriate day for that. Now, some of us here who are married are not either mothers, we're not grandmothers, we may not be fathers or grandfathers, but there are times in our life when we may be that, and certainly there are, for all of us, times whereby we have influence on others. And so, for that fact, these are profitable for all of us here today as we think about them, no matter what stage of life we are in. If you have your Bibles, you can take them and open them to Proverbs chapter 1. Of course, all of you, while you're turning there, know that recently my wife and I welcomed into our extended family our eighth grandchild. I sometimes jokingly comment to my wife that I can't believe I'm married to a grandmother. And that's what she does right before she hits me. But seriously, it seems a bit odd for her and I to think of ourselves as being grandparents even though the reality is that we are, and every time we look in the mirror, we realize we're growing older. And growing old doesn't really consume our thoughts, but, but we do think often about the heritage that we will leave behind when we are gone. And it ought to be on our minds as individuals for all of us as people. Even when we're young, we ought to be starting to think about the influence we have on others, and the heritage that we will leave behind when we're gone. Some time ago, the late radio broadcaster Paul Harvey, remember him, the rest of the story, he, he gave a description once about parenthood, and he was focusing on fathers in it and what it meant for them, what they leave behind. And I, I think it really kind of speaks to uh, parents in general, as he spoke this way, even though he directed it as at fathers, and he said this, quote, a father is a creature that is forced to endure childbirth without any anesthetic. He, he growls when, when he feels good and laughs when he's scared half to death. He, he never feels worthy of the worship in his children's eyes. He never quite is quite the hero that his daughter thinks him to be, never quite the man his son believes him to be. And this worries him, at least sometimes. So he works hard to try to smooth the rough places in the road for those of his own who will follow him. The father gets very angry when the school grades aren't as good as he thinks they should be. And so he scolds his children even though he knows it's the teacher's fault. The father knows that he's not the smartest person in the world and that even though others know that and that he's nearly not good enough, he knows that he has grandchildren who are obviously smarter than anybody else's grandchildren. 
and a father makes bets with insurance companies about who will live the longest, and one day he loses, and the bet is paid off to those he leaves behind. And I read that, and I think about how interesting that is as a perspective on life, because in the end, the world at least, the world at large around us, the world in which we live as Christians, it all boils down to that simple fact, just the lump of some lump of money at the end that you leave to those who are left behind. That's the legacy. But because we are Christians, because we believe in Jesus Christ, then we know that while that kind of thing might be helpful in some monetary way for the moment in an economic sense, the real and lasting legacy to leave behind that far outvalues any kind of monetary thing is a godly example and a godly progeny. In fact, in our adult Sunday school class in the morning, they have been going through First Timothy and we ended this morning in chapter 4 with the whole reality of Paul saying to Timothy, listen, you, you discipline yourself for godliness. Right? Godliness is profitable for now and for the future. You can discipline yourself in a lot of different things, but if it isn't godliness, then, then you're really wasting your time because it's only for this earth that those things last, but godliness lasts for not only this earth, but also that which is to come. So our goal is to be ensuring that the ones whom we personally have care over and influence over in our lives and in our homes, the goal is that they hear the truth concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ and how that relationship with Jesus Christ affects every other area of life. In fact, to do the opposite or to neglect that task in any kind of way in our lives is described by a very descriptive word in the Bible. It's a, one of those great four-letter words, and it's the word fool. To do otherwise is to be a fool. The word fool, in all of its forms in Scripture, as it comes to us in the original languages, is found nearly 187 times in the entire Bible, and 75 of those times it is found in the book that we know the, to be the book of wisdom. It is found more times than any in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs describes the fool and their character more than anywhere else. And so when the Bible speaks about foolishness in any way, 40% of the time it speaks about it from this very book. Now, over the last several months in our men's study, we did a lengthy study here in the book of Proverbs, and we came away, really, if we wanted to boil it all down with one simple understanding of the book of Proverbs, and that is just this. It actually is not just in theory, but in reality, the book of wisdom. You say you spent all those months studying and that's what you came away with? Listen, if you come away with that and that alone, you are way ahead of your colleagues. Because most people think of it as a book of moral platitudes. Things we go to and half the time we don't understand what it's saying. And yet here is God's book of wisdom. Skilled living, that's what wisdom means in its simplest form, skilled living. And if we are to think about all of that in a, in a careful way, then we understand that the book of Proverbs is God's counsel on how to live spiritually and physically skillful lives. How we are to live in this life and be prepared for the and live out spiritual lives even now and for the future in the time to come in a skillful way. So it is a very profitable book, profitable book for any of us to spend our time with. It's filled with instruction for navigating away from a life of foolishness. So this morning, for our time together, I want us to open to Proverbs, if you're not there already, and I want to look at how easy it is to either raise a fool or be a fool. 
probably that's probably a more accurate title for our time this morning, how easy it is for us to be fools. This is how I, I, I think about this when I think about this, these, these principles that I want to share this morning, because I want us to look at it from that perspective. How is it that we are being fools or might be fools? Because sometimes we hear better how not to be something when we see maybe from the perspective of what we are already doing. Right? Psalm 1 says it this way, Blessed is the man who does not do these things, but he does these things. And he says it that way so that we go, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm doing those things that I shouldn't be doing, and that's why this is going on with me in my life. And Proverbs does the same thing, and so I want us to look at it from that way. Instead of us learning how to <clears throat> be wise... I want us to look this morning at how easy it is to be a fool. Not because I believe we should be, but because I believe that if we see how we may already be doing those things, how easy it is, then maybe by God's grace we'll change direction. We'll edit those things so that then our example as influencers will be not one of foolishness, but one of wisdom. Some time ago, several years ago now, I spent some time one morning and just listed the characteristics of a fool from the book of Proverbs. And it didn't take me any time at all just to flip through the pages of Proverbs and write down uh, a, a list. And I came up with 51 characteristics of a fool. 51 different characteristics of a fool. So if you have your pen ready, you begin to write these down. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. This morning, I want to condense those and give us just five. Five principles or characteristics of a fool for us to hold on to. Five sure ways that you will be an influence to foolishness if you do these things. Five guarantees that will ensure that not only you yourself will be a fool, but all those who follow you will also be a fool as well if they follow in your steps. So how easy is it to raise a fool? It's pretty easy. Guarantee number one is this. <clears throat> you want to be a fool yourself? You want to influence fools behind, behind you? Then do this. Teach those in your sphere of influence to despise wisdom. Teach them to despise wisdom. There are several places in the book of Proverbs where we are exhorted to love wisdom, to love it. We are exhorted to embrace it, to, to take it in as if it's our, our most favorite food that we eat. But it says in Proverbs that fools despise wisdom. You can notice it right here in the first few verses of chapter 1, verse 7 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That simply means, if we wanted to put it in simple terms, what fools do is they do not fear the Lord. Fools do not have a reverence for God Himself. Fools look at that which is around them. They look at themselves. They look at life. They look at instruction. And they say to themselves, why in the world would I do that? Fools despise wisdom. The question is asked of fools, in fact, in verse 22 of Proverbs 1. How long, O oh, naive ones, that's the word there for fools, how long, O oh, naive ones, will you love simplicity? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing. Fools hate knowledge, it says. Fools hate wisdom. They hate skilled living. They hate doing what is wise. So if we as influencers in others' lives, if we who know we have people who are following us, particularly us who are parents and grandparents of 
those within our own families, if we want to raise fools behind us, then ensure that you yourself are a fool by despising wisdom. Ensure in your own life that you do not fear the Lord. How? By hating wisdom yourself. By hating wisdom. It's a, a, a biblical axiomatic truth that if you hate instruction, then you actually do not fear the Lord. Now think about that in your own life. Oftentimes it's easy for us to say, oh, I, I fear the Lord, I fear the Lord. Fear, the fear of the Lord begins with humility, right? We have to be humble people, those who see ourselves before a holy God as who we really are. It begins with humility, right? And if we're not humble people, the reality is we really don't love truth because truth speaks to us and says, hey, this is the way you need to go. And so the exact opposite is true of us. If we hate instruction, then we are also despisers of wisdom. We really hate wisdom. We are not God-fearers, and therefore we hate wisdom because God is the personification of wisdom. And we would say, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone hate wisdom? It seems actually foolish. I mean, we would even say that in our own human logic. No one would do that. No one would be so foolish as to actually despise wisdom, right? No one would say that. And it's true. No thinking person, no person in their practical thinking, no Christian person would actually do that. So what does it mean to despise wisdom? That's the question we want to ask. What does it mean? Well, here's what despise means in its simplest form. It simply means to mock. To mock. Now, we think of mocking as if it's somebody who's saying something, and somebody goes, yeah, whatever, 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 and certainly that's a sense of mocking. It's, mock means to sneer at something, to, to shrug it off as unimportant. Well, how, how might I be doing that as a Christian? How might I be doing that in my own life and thereby in doing that, teaching those who are behind me, those in my sphere of influence, those in my own family who I have responsibility to lead, how might I be mocking at the Word of God, despising the Word of God? Well, that's a great question. Turn over to Proverbs 5. Turn over to Proverbs 5. Notice, notice what Proverbs says as if speaking as a wise person, beginning in verse, four, or verse 12. Notice what it says. And you say, how have I hated instruction? There's the question. Oh, what does it look like? How, how I have hated instruction. He's making an exclamation and saying, I've been such a fool. I've hated instruction. And my heart spurned reproof. I how not listened to the voice of my teachers. There's despising wisdom. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers. I have not inclined my ear to my instructors. And therefore what has happened? I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly in the congregation. That's despising wisdom. Listen, as much as we learn by example, we teach by example. We teach by example. We may say, well, there's no one really that I have influence over in my life. Oh, yes, you do, because there are people watching your example. And we teach others who are watching us and others who are following us to be fools each and every time we turn our backs on gaining instruction from the truth. Each and every time we mock, we sneer at, we push aside, we do not absorb we do not want to absorb we don't want to spend our time absorbing 
the words of truth. Every time, listen, every time we arbitrarily, by our own choice and foolishness, stay away from the fellowship of the body of Christ that God has given to us as a gift, each and every time we just go, you know what, I'm not going to be with the people of God and be strengthened and built up in my faith and my spiritual life. Every time I stay away, I'm not glorifying God and I'm certainly not receiving wisdom. And when we do that, what are we doing? We are teaching those who follow us that really truth really isn't all that important. The truth of God really doesn't matter. You can give or take. It's so really nearly just sometimes you, you, you decide and other times arbitrarily you decide not to. And what we are doing with our actions is we are just mocking at wisdom. It's really not all that important. Each time we choose to just brush the truth off or not bring the truth to bear in the lives of those who, who are in our sphere of influence simply because it might be difficult, simply because it might be a challenge to us. Maybe it'll cause some kind of emotional upheaval in their life or because we might have to put in an actual effort in order to understand a truth so that we can correctly put it into practice, not only in our lives, but help others put it into their lives. Every time we choose to arbitrarily neglect that, we are despising the truth and we're training up fools in our wake. In fact, notice what Proverbs 8, verse 12 says. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. That word dwell means I camp there. That's where I camp. I, I and prudence live in the same house. I, I find knowledge and discretion. This is where I live. Prudence and wisdom go hand in hand. Prudence and wisdom are... are two sides of the same coin. They're linked together. You can't have one without the other. Prudence simply means care or, or caution and good judgment. It's, it's wisdom in practice. It's wisdom that looks ahead. It's wisdom that's thinking before. And some interesting synonyms for prudence. If you can't think of words for the synonyms, you can put words next to it like the word calculation or foresight or even forethought. Those are good words as synonyms for prudence. All of those imply using care. Care to prepare for what is to come or care to prepare for possible contingencies that might come about. All of those speak about not mocking truth. Not mocking truth. And any time we, we stay away or any time we just willfully, arbitrarily avoid the truth, whether it's our own reading of the truth or our own absorption into it, engaging with the truth, or any time it's our arbitrary removal from listening to the truth or engulfing ourselves around those who are walking in truth, any time we arbitrarily do that, the Word of God's telling us we are despising wisdom. Because wisdom would never do that. Wisdom deals together with prudence and wisdom is skill for living. And that's not a way to skillfully live. And any time, of course, we're despising wisdom, then we are helping to raise fools in our wake. And I don't know where all of us are in our own lives concerning that very principle. But as you sit here this morning and you hear from it in that negative sense, you're thinking about the positive ways in which maybe you need to shore up some areas in your own life whereby there has been a despising of wisdom, a mocking at truth. Are we content in being fools? That's the question. I trust that we're not. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So guarantee number one for being a fool and raising fools is to teach them to despise wisdom. I think about this in my own life and 
go to God often in my own heart as I realize areas where I just simply am not shored up as I ought to be. Guarantee number two, if you want to cultivate foolishness in your life or cultivate it in the lives of others that follow you, then teach them to cultivate personal laziness in their life. Teach them to cultivate personal laziness. Why? Because fools are lazy. Notice what it says in Proverbs 10 and verse 5. Proverbs 10, verse 5 says, He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. Now there's a classic description there in the second part of that verse for a fool. Right? Shame is that classic description for the fool. And laziness brings shame in life. This is the one who sleeps during harvest. He, he's lazy when work needs to be done. Sla laziness, as you look around, as you survey our own world, it seems as if today laziness is at an epidemic level. We just went through a pandemic, and yet it seems like now we're in another worldwide sickness, and it's called laziness. It's epidemic. You can ask any business owner, anybody who has employees, they just can't seem to find anyone to work, let alone find good workers. I remember years ago when I lived in Florida, there was a company, I think it was a lawn care company, I'm not, I don't remember what kind of company it was, it might have been a home service company, something. And their, their company slogan was just this, call us, we show up. That's what it said on the side of their trucks, call us, we show up. And I thought, wow, what kind of business model, what kind of world do we live in where, where, where that is your advertising slogan for your business? Listen, we just come. You call us and we say we're going to be there, we're going to be there. We have integrity. We're not lazy. So even businesses, companies seemingly are lazy and miss out on business because they just won't show up. When it's time of harvest, they don't go. They, they're, they're acting shamefully. I was reading recently a humorous column that said a group of senior citizens were longing or lounging out on the patio of their retirement community. And one looked up at a large flock of birds that flew over, and he leaned over to his friend who was sleeping in the chair next to him, said, Frank, you better move around. Those look like buzzards. They're closing in on us. <laughs> That's what happens, right? We retire, we stop moving. We stop doing. And here's the point. The point is, don't get lazy. Don't get lazy. Keep moving. Keep doing. Keep engaging. In fact, if you go back a few chapters to chapter 6, right, God tells us to go to the smallest of the creatures that He has created in His creation and learn about how not to be lazy. Proverbs 6, verse 6, Go to the ant, O sluggard, Observe her ways and what? Be wise. Learn wisdom. Follow the ant. Look, if you got a problem with laziness, get on your hands and knees on your face in the backyard over the ant pile and watch what they do. They don't have any chief. There isn't any officer. There's no ruler. In other words, there's no one telling them, hey, you need to do this. Go do this. Make sure you do this. Yet, they prepare their food in summer. They gather their provision in harvest. And so the question is asked in verse 9, how long will you lie down, O sluggard? You say, well, how might I be teaching those who follow after me to be lazy? Well, here's one simple way. If you have kids in the home, then let them go through life without making a contribution to the life they enjoy. You provide 
a pretty significant life that they're enjoying in your home and and yet you may not be requiring them to contribute to that life by way of their unlaziness around the home. They need to do things, require chores of them in the home. Don't let them just get by without doing anything. Don't wash their clothes, make their meals, make their beds, and do all the things, the domestic details of life, expecting that when they leave your home, they won't be lazy people. Teach them to do those things. Don't let them sleep in all the days of the hour, or all the hours of the day. No. If you want to teach them to be lazy, then don't require that they contribute financially to their wants. My kids used to ask me when they were younger, Dad, can we have an allowance? I used to always say to them, you just ate it. <laughs> you just ate your allowance. Right? We, love, we love the easy road, man. That's our heart. It's easy to be easy. And as people, we love, we love our sleep. We love to sleep in. It feels so good. But Proverbs 6 asks this question, how long will you lie down? The implication is pretty simple, that if you've been there in bed, you've been there long enough. Some of us have a real relationship with our alarm clocks because we're hitting it multiple times in the morning. <laughs> Stop hitting your alarm clock. It, hit, it didn't do anything to you. Just get up. In fact, look what Proverbs 26, 14 says about the sluggard. Proverbs 26, 14. It's very, very picturesque. I mean, you can't miss the picture here in it of the sluggard. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. Ah, oh, it feels good to just roll over to the next side and the next side and the next side and the next side. How long are you going to be there just rolling over? The psalmist or the uh, Proverbs is saying, get up. Get up. Notice verse 15. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He's weary of bringing it to his mouth again. He's so lazy he can't even feed himself, won't feed himself. Why? Because he's wise in his own eyes. He's more wise than seven men who can give a discreet answer. He doesn't take instruction from anybody. That's the sluggard. So what's the cure? What's the cure for that? Well, engage yourself in serving others. All of those things about the sluggard is saying, listen, it's all about me. I'm the only one. I'm the one I'm serving, and I'm not serving anybody else. Well, serve others, and you'll stop being lazy because it won't be about you. Stop making excuses as to why you can't be involved in some God-glorifying activity. Don't do that. That's just laziness talking. The proverb says only fools are lazy. So if you want to guarantee foolishness in your own life and guarantee those who are following you to be fools in their lives, then teach them to despise wisdom. And number two, teach them to cultivate laziness. Guarantee number three is this, and this is frightening to me. This is frightening. You want to teach fools? You want to be a fool in your own life? Then... Teach others to follow their own heart. Teach others to follow their own heart. Go over to Proverbs 28 and verse 26. Proverbs 28, 26. Notice what it says. He who trusts in his own heart is a, and everybody said, fool. Pretty clear. You don't need a seminary degree to understand what that means. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. The word trust there means to put confidence in. He who puts his confidence in. The one who puts confidence in his own heart, the Bible calls a fool. Does that shock you? Does that shock you to hear that? Because one of the most frightening statements that I hear from time to time when someone is struggling about an issue or some life-changing decision in their life, they will hear people tell them, oh, listen, just follow your heart. I cringe at that. I shake at that. Why? Because of this verse. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. 
The heart itself is one of the most dangerous things there is. God says, don't trust your heart. Don't do that. It's the worst thing you could do. Just listen. This is what Jesus said flows from the heart. He says that every kind of wickedness flows from the heart. Matthew 15, verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and slanders. That's out of the heart. You don't want to follow your heart. What you need to follow, what we need to follow is God's heart. Not our heart. We need to follow God's heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. And then he asks the question, who can understand it? The implication there is, listen, we don't even understand our heart. Why would we ever follow it? We think, oh, my feelings are right. No, your feelings aren't right. Your feelings are fickle. Your feelings are all over the map. You need to go to the truth. You need to go to the Word of God and have your feelings adjusted to that. Don't follow your heart. Listen, man left to himself can't even understand his own heart. That's obvious in our world today, isn't it? I feel like, as a biological man, that I'm a woman. Well, you're clueless, my friend. And you're not going to allow the rest of us or the rest of us who who are living in the reality of truth, aren't going to accept your fantasy. And yet in our world today, that's what's accepted. Fantasy land. Listen, don't follow your heart. There is nothing more unsafe than to put confidence in your heart for this life. Don't do it. You say, so what should I trust in? What should I trust in? Well, go back to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Those of you who are part of our church hopefully have read this before because you get it from me on that special day that God brought you into the world. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust in your own heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Why? Because in all of your ways you can acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. So don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You want to fix it? Trust in the Lord. And then you'll be wise. Those who follow you, if they follow you in your steps, will be following in wisdom. They will be learning to be wise. So number one, teach them to despise wisdom. Third, teach them to trust their own heart. Don't do that. Don't do that. Two, teach them to be lazy. Don't do that. Guarantee number four. Guarantee number four. You want to guarantee foolishness in your own life and those that follow, then speak negatively of others. Teach those in your sphere of influence to speak negatively of others. Once again, Proverbs 6, verse 12 to 14. A worthless person, a wicked man, is one who walks with a false mouth who winks with his eyes, who signals with his feet, who points with his fingers, who with perversity in his heart devises evil continually, who spreads strife. That's a graphic description. The mouth can be a dangerous thing. Right? James tells us that it's like a flame. James 3 the tongue is like a flame. It's like a little spark that can light a whole forest on fire. It doesn't take much to create a big problem. That's the idea. So the tongue can be very destructive. And one of the ways it destroys is through lying. Lying. Verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, is one who walks with a false mouth. 
So the, the words here, worthless and wicked, are the description of the fool. The worthless person is described by these words because it speaks of the person who is actually devoid of godliness. He's wicked. He's worthless. So to walk in this way is to be carrying your life, listen, as if you don't know God at all. So this is the utter essence of foolishness as a Christian. This is not the Christian character to walk with a false mouth because those who walk with a false mouth are actually devoid of godliness. So the fool is one who carries his life by lying. He exaggerates and lies and, and slanders. In fact, the word false mouth here is a very descriptive word in the original language. It, it really is translated deceit. You can translate it that way. Deceit. And the word in the original language that was used for that was the same word used for baiting a fish. Baiting a fish. In other words, a fool speaks luring words. Words that are baiting words. Words that, that catch others wrongfully. Words that speak wrongfully, that, that seem real, but they speak falsely. They're not really what it's all about. And so they speak maybe highly about themselves, and they embellish what they really are, and yet speak down about others. And fools do that. They complain about others constantly, and they complain about others to others. That's a fool. They argue against the truth. In fact, this is what Proverbs 18 uh, says to us about it. Proverbs 18, verse 1 and 2. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. And so you know you're in the presence of foolishness or you're being a fool yourself when you're unwilling to even have a discussion to try to gain understanding. If you just say, no, no, it's all about me. I just want to say this and then I'm out. Well, that's not wisdom. That's foolishness. Wisdom would sit and have that discussion to gain understanding, but fools don't delight in understanding. They only want to reveal their own mind. They only want to say what they want to say, and that's it. No one else gets to say anything. And the worst form of that kind of lying, the worst form of that kind of fraud, if you will, is gossipy slander. Look at with me at chapter 10, Proverbs 10, verse 18. He who conceals hatred has lying lips. <laughs> and he who spreads slander is a fool. Worst kind of lying is slander. What the proverb is saying here is if there's some kind of hating going on, some kind of real angst happening... What does a wise person do? A wise person uncovers that with truth. They uncover that. They expose that because that's what wisdom does. Wisdom brings truth to bear and truth exposes the lies. But what does a fool do? A fool just goes, oh, okay, I'll hear the evil. I'll hear the evil and then I'll go about spreading slander to others about what that is. God hates that. God hates that. In fact, look at chapter 10, verse 14. Wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of the fool ruin with in the mouth of the fool ruin is at hand. God takes this pretty seriously when it comes to the mouth of his people and to reveal that reality about fools. In fact, back in Proverbs 6. Notice what God hates. Beginning in verse 16, there are six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to Him. What is it? Haughty eyes, He hates that. That's an abomination to the Lord. A lying tongue, that's an abomination to the Lord. 
hands that shed innocent blood, that's an abomination to the Lord. So all of these folks that think they're doing their own bidding as they kill their own children in the womb, God hates that. It's an abomination. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, Notice, a false witness who utters lies and one who spreads strife among the brothers. It's a serious stuff. If you want to raise a fool, then you yourself despise wisdom. You yourself cultivate laziness in your life and allow it to be in the lives of those you have influence for. Trust your own heart rather than the heart of God. And go about in your life speaking negatively of others, spreading strife. Number five. Number five. You want to be a fool yourself? You want to raise fools in your wake? Then teach them to mock at sin. Teach them to mock at sin. Proverbs 14, verse 9 Very simple, very straightforward, very clear. Fools mock at sin. Fools mock at sin. We already know what mock is. We talked about it earlier. We scoff at it. We sneer at it, right? Simplest way we could say it is don't take your sin seriously. If you want to be a fool, don't take your sin seriously. Think about your own sin and go, it's no big deal. You do that, you will be a fool and you'll train fools behind you. Just don't take it serious. Don't, don't be, see your sin and go, eh, whatever. It's not a biggie. It is a biggie. Because fools mock at sin. But notice the upright among them, and, and that the implication is those who take their sin seriously, they're upright because they've confessed their sin, they've turned from their sin, and among them there is goodwill. In fact, turn over to Romans 6. Because this is exactly what Paul says we are to do about our sin. Right? If we know Jesus Christ, we know our sin's been forgiven us. And the temptation is, okay, what do we say? Are we to continue in sin because we, the grace of God is, is there flooding our lives with this vivid picture of God's grace as He's forgiven our sin? And we know we're not sinless in practice here and there. We, we sin even though we know God, so do we just continue in sin? And of course, Paul says, no, you're not to do that. And here's what he says in verse 12. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't, don't let that be the ruler of you so that you should obey it. Don't do that. Don't go on presenting, verse 13, the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But what? Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. You're alive in Christ, right? You have a new, you're a new creature in Christ, as Paul said to the Corinthian believers. You, you're alive from the dead and your members you need, they are instruments of, of righteousness to God. Sin is not to be master over you. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Paul says, listen, grace, the grace of God doesn't give you license to do whatever you want now that you're a Christian. The grace of God is the very thing you realize why you have the freedom to do what you ought not to do. So don't let sin reign in you. Utterly destroy it first. Why? What happens if we don't? What happens if we just let sin reign in us? Well, I want to just do a quick survey. Just go back to the book of Numbers. I'm going to go through a few Old Testament passages here. Just to kind of seal this in our minds. The nation of Israel. Numbers Chapter 33, beginning in verse 50, the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab, 
by the Jordan opposite Jericho. And he said to them, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all of their figured stones and destroy all of their molten images and demolish all of their high places. And you shall take possession of the land and live in it, for I have given you the land to possess it. So there's, a, there's the clear command to Israel. When you go into the promised land, you're to do exactly what I said to the people that I tell you to do it to. You're to do it how I said it, when I said it. This is what you are to do, and you're to take possession of what I am giving you. And you shall inherit the land, he says in verse 54, by, by lot, according to your families. To the larger you give more inheritance, to the smaller families you give less inheritance. Whatever falls to anyone, this shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But, verse 55, if you do not drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land which you live. And it shall come about that as I plan to do to them, so I will do to you. So now they have a clear picture of exactly what God requires. Here's what God says, do what I say, and if you don't, there's going to be this severe consequence in your life. Now go over to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, God reiterates this warning to them, beginning in verse 1, When the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you are entering to possess it, and shall clear away the many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, and you shall defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no favor to them. It's very clear. Verse 3, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. Why? Because they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. Go over to Joshua. What did they do? Joshua 23. Very clear. The commands are very clear. Exactly what they should do. What did they do? Joshua 23, beginning in verse 11. So take diligent heed of yourselves to love the Lord your God, Joshua says to them. For if ever you go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you, and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God is giving you. There it is again. Now they are in the land. They have dispossessed some of the people in the land so that they could take the nation, take it as their own as God had promised. Joshua warns them again. Now go over to Judges. Judges chapter 2. The next book, we're just walking through what's going on. What happens? Judges chapter 2, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal and Bochim. When it says the angel of the Lord, this is the pre-incarnate Christ. And he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. And verse 4 says, And it came about, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. They realized their sinfulness to God. They did not do what God said. They acted as fools. They acted as fools. 
And you say, well, what's the cure? What's the cure? What, what do I do if I fall prey to this same kind of thing? What do I do if I'm a fool? If I've acted a fool? If I haven't done what I ought to do? Or maybe I'm doing that now. What do I need to do? We'll go back to Proverbs. Proverbs 30. Final chapter in Proverbs, the words, or Proverbs, or the second to the final chapter of Proverbs. The words of Agar, the son of Jekah, the oracle, the man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal. Obviously, this is a father giving his sons wisdom. He says, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have knowledge of the Holy One. Here's the question. What do I do? I've been more stupid. I didn't, didn't go after wisdom. What do I need to do? I didn't follow the God. Notice verse 4. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What his name or his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words lest He reprove you and you be found a liar. Two things I ask of you then, God. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Now turn over to verse 32. He goes on to speak much about what he has learned about God and himself. And he says, If I have been foolish, verse 32, in exalting Myself, says it in the, as if he's speaking to his sons, if you have been foolish in exalting yourself or if you have plotted evil, put your hand on your mouth. He's saying, he's saying, repent of that. Stop. Acknowledge your sin and turn from it. What do I do if I've been foolish? Acknowledge where you've been foolish and turn from it. Fear God, guard your mind, be around those who will, will help you in that direction, control your passions, watch your words, don't be lazy, manage what God has given you, and serve others. If we do that, then we will ensure that we leave a heritage of wisdom to those who follow us and not a heritage of foolishness. And that's what God desires for us. Is it any wonder that the final words of this chapter are what it means to find a godly wife? Oh, my son. Chapter 31. Son of my womb, son of my vows, do not give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. It's exactly what Israel did. It's not for kings. Is it not for kings, O Lemuel? Is it not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong weak, lest they drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted? Don't do that. Be wise. Be careful. Watch what you do. Follow wisdom. That's our desire, is it not? As Christians, we don't just follow wisdom as a generic reality. We follow the one who is wisdom. 
God himself, our Savior Jesus Christ, who came to the earth to save sinners like us. That's who we follow. I trust that's our heart. Let's pray together. Father, what a blessed day we've had together. Lord, just really walking quickly through these principles, we could have spent hours on each one and just thinking more and more deeply into it. You have been sufficient for us in all things. And so I pray that we would put these things into practice, that we would look at ourselves, adjust where it needs to be adjusted, and thank you for the conviction. We just want to honor you, help us to honor you in all things, in our words, in our actions, our deeds knowing that you love us and care for us and the chastening of your loving hand is a grace in our life. So thank you for that. Bless each one here, Lord. Cause them to be wise in you, wise in your word, and that from that wise living, they would be an example to others to follow. May our heritage be one that is godly, not one that is foolish, so that you might receive all the praise. In Christ's name we pray, amen.